next topic is cellular decompositions and triangulations. So the <coughs> this definition is actually good uh, to uh, talk about n-dimensional objects for any n, but we're going to use it to talk just about surfaces, which are two-dimensional objects. So we're going to define a notion of a cellular decomposition of a surface x. So firstly, if n is 0, 1, and 2, and so on, we write dn uh, for the set of points x in r to the n with norm less than or equal to 1. This is a closed unit disk or unit ball in r to the n. We write dn interior, so the set of points x in r to the n with norm strictly less than 1. So that's the open unit ball. And then the boundary of d to the n, which is a sphere of dimension n minus 1, instead of points x in r to the n with norm equal to 1. Um, OK, so we have the, the closed unit ball, the open unit ball, and the sphere. So now let x be a compact surface. Uh, so it's a topological space, satisfying some conditions. A cellular decomposition of x uh, is a finite collection of continuous maps um, going from uh, these n cells, um, dn, uh, into x. Um, and we're going to write the... We, because we're interested in a two-dimensional object, we only take cells of dimension 0, 1, and 2. Um, the zero cells we're going to write as vi, uh, v is a vertex, the one cells we'll write as ej, where e is for edge, and the two cells we'll write as fk, f is a face. So uh, we want a finite collection of maps uh, vi going from d0 into x, d0 is a point um, in r to zero, which is just one point. Um, so the maps vi are called zero cells or vertices. Um, we also have some a collection of maps ej going from d1 into x. d1 is the closed interval minus 1 up to 1. Um, so that's the uh, unit ball in r to the 1. Um, and these maps ej are called 1 cells or edges. And then finally, uh, some maps fk going from d2, uh, the unit disk in r2, uh, into x. These are called 2 cells or faces. And if you wanted to uh, define a certain decomposition of an n-dimensional topological manifold, let's say, then you'd do the same thing uh, going all the way up to map some dn into x. OK, so these, these collection of maps, these cells, have to satisfy three conditions. Firstly, uh, each map restricted to the interior, d0 end, the open ball, is a homeomorphism with its image in X. Uh, so these maps are continuous maps, uh, which are isomorphisms on their interior with an open set in X. Um, but on the boundary, for example, on the boundary of the two disk, uh, you don't need to have a homeomorphism, uh, meaning that, for example, uh, the two cell map could be injective on its interior, but it could be um, it could fail to be injective on the boundary. OK, so second end condition is that for each n, uh, the image of the boundary of d to the n, so the image of the, um, the n minus 1 sphere, is contained in the images of the cells of dimensions strictly less than n. So um, for uh, the vertices, that's a trivial condition because d0 has no boundary. For the edges, that tells you that the endpoints minus 1 and plus 1 of d1 get sent to the images of some of the vertices. And for the faces, that tells you that the, uh, the circle at the boundary of d2 gets sent to the images of the edges and the vertices combined. <coughs> and thirdly, uh, x has to be the disjoint union of the images of the interiors of the cells. Um, Okay, so x is now being cut into um, some number of pieces, one corresponding to each vertex edge and face. Uh, each of these uh, images 
uh, is homeomorphic to uh, the well, the interior of D0 is just a point. Uh, that's the interior of D1 is an open interval. The interior of D2 is an open disk in R2. Okay, so uh, you'll find this notion of cellular, cellular decomposition in uh, the Ritter notes uh, is essentially the same as the notion of a subdivision in the Hitchin lecture notes, which are usually my primary reference. Um, so what Hitchin means by a subdivision uh, doesn't involve maps, uh, but it involves a division of your topological space X into uh, a disjoint union of um, subsets, uh, each subset being a point or an open interval or an open disk. Um, so basically Hitchin's notion of subdivision is more or less the same as remembering the subsets VI of D0, uh, EJ of the interior D1, FK of the interior D2, so the uh, it's this disjoint union uh, of the images there, uh, but Hitchin's notion of subdivision doesn't remember the maps VJ, EJ and FK. Um, so um, I chose to go with Ritter's notion of cellular decomposition rather than Hitchin's notion of subdivision because I find the conditions which Hitchin imposes on his sets in his subdivision not very transparent. Um, for the purposes of answering finals questions, uh, I really don't care which you use as long as you get the details right. Um, and there's, I think there are probably other ways of, of talking about um, what we're doing, which is basically taking a, a topological space and breaking it up into um, some number of standard pieces, um, basically vertices, edges, and faces. Okay, so let's talk about what this means. Um, a cellular decomposition or subdivision is basically a division of X uh, into pieces. The pieces are basically polygons, uh, the faces, um, and they have edges and vertices. So each edge has to end up two vertices um, and two faces meet at an edge and so on. So the maps EJ and FK uh, are not required to be injective on their boundaries. So that means, for example, that an edge could end at the same vertex at both ends. Uh, so this, this is a, a sketch of, um, let's say, the closed infill minus 1 up to 1 in R mapping into X goes here. And then at this point, minus 1 is mapped to 1. Um, and the minus 1, 1 point has to be the image of a vertex map as well. Uh, similarly, uh, a face could have repeated edges and vertices in its boundary. So here I've drawn uh, a kind of section of a cylinder. I'm thinking of this section of a cylinder as being, um, well, a disc, uh, but the disc is homeomorphic to a rectangle. So think about taking a, a circle with um, four points no, uh, nominated as vertices uh, around its, well, a disc with four points nominated as vertices around its boundary, uh, and then you can kind of map that to a rectangle by um, making the angles uh, at the um, four vertices more uh, sharper. Um, so then we've taken this, uh, this disc, uh, we've bent it round and glued it to itself along a portion of its boundary uh, to give us a, um, a portion of the cylinder. Here are one, two vertices, one, two, three edges, and one face. Uh, so in this case, um, the map from the closed unit disk in R2 into our topological space fails to be injective along this um, edge because two points in the boundary of the two disks are getting sent to uh, one point uh, in the topological space where the, the edges are being glued together. So that's an example of a face with repeated edges in its boundary. Okay, so we've talked already about planar models. Um, which were what you get when you take uh, a closed polygon uh, in the plane and you identify uh, pairs of edges um, and then you end up identifying the vertices of that polygon in groups. So a planar model uh, is equivalent to a cellular decomposition or a subdivision which has exactly one face. So um, 
you essentially you're taking a closed two disk, uh, which is homeomorphic to a polygon with vertices and edges, um, and then you're mapping that into your topological surface X in such a way that the interior of the disk is identified homeomorphically with an open set, and then the edges and the faces uh, get identified in a, uh, a non-injective way. Okay, so a triangulation uh, is a special kind of cellular decomposition or subdivision. I, I use these ideas more or less interchangeably, although they're not quite the same because the cellular decomposition contains more information. The cellular decomposition uh, remembers the maps, whereas the subdivision forgets them. Um, so triangulation is a cellular decomposition or subdivision in which each, each face has three edges uh, and three vertices, um, possibly repeated in its boundary. Um, so that is a triangulation is a way of dividing your topological surface X uh, into closed triangles uh, with the edges of the triangles glued in pairs. Okay, so this is uh, related to another important concept in topology which you may have met already, uh, that of a uh, simplicial decomposition, um, or a, a simplicial set. Um, and again, a simplicial set, which is another of these ideas which works in any number of dimensions, is a way of dividing a topological space into simplices. So uh, a triangle is a two-dimensional simplex um, a tetrahedron in three dimensions is a three-dimensional simplex, and there's uh, a, a kind of general notion of uh, sim simplices in n dimensions, which is a kind of um, a simplex in n dimensions is basically the convex hull of n plus one points in R to the n, um, and uh, they're a good kind of standard brick out of which uh, you can build topological spaces by uh, gluing the bricks together. Um, so I have had questions before on uh, the difference between triangulations and um, simplicial sets or simplicial decompositions. Um, I believe you may have seen a definition of simplicial set which requires the, um, the edges and the vertices of any simplex to be distinct. Uh, our notion of triangulation, we would allow a, uh, a triangle to have repeated vertices, for example, or, or repeated edges. Um, so you could take uh, one, two triangles and you could glue them um, along their entire boundary to make a two-sphere, for example. Uh, that might not count, or perhaps it would count as a simplicial set. Anyway, um, uh, as I said before, uh, for the purposes of answering finals questions, um, I don't mind whether you do it in terms of cellular decompositions or subdivisions whatever, as long as you get the details right for whatever uh, model you've chosen. Okay, so um, one uh, important result we will use is um, a theorem, theorem 2.1, uh, every compact surface X admits a triangulation. Um, so the proof of this is beyond the scope of the course. Um, later on in the course we will comment on uh, ways of constructing triangulations if X has a bit more structure, uh, if X has the structure of a Riemann surface, if it's a, a compact surface with a complex structure, or a smooth surface when you can imagine algorithms to actually build a triangulation. Um, okay, um, worth noting that if your surface X is compact and you have a cellular decomposition or a uh, subdivision, then there are always um, only finitely many pieces in this um, decomposition, because by compactness you can uh, make some argument with um, <coughs> uh, with taking uh, uh, an open cover and a finite subcover and so on. All right, um, now let's move on to uh, section 2.5 about the Euler characteristic. So the Euler characteristic is a number that we associate to uh, 
a compact surface. In fact, Euler characteristics are well defined for um, essentially any sufficiently nice um, topological space. And uh, we'll uh, get on to what sufficiently nice uh, means a bit later. Uh, but for the case of surfaces, um, let's make a definition. Um, let X be a compact surface. Now we choose uh, a decomposition or subdivision of X, uh, which has capital V vertices, capital E edges and capital F faces. That is V and E and F are the numbers of vertices and edges and faces. Um, and the Euler characteristic of X is um, chi of X. So this is the Greek letter chi, which is more or less um, for the k sound. Chi of X is V minus E plus F uh, as an integer. So you should certainly learn this formula. And um, the first thing to say about it, uh, a theorem, is that the Euler characteristic chi of x depends only on x as a topological space um, and not on the choice of subdivision. Um, and that would not be true, for example, if we chose some other linear combination or function of v's and e's and f's in general. Um, it's a magic property of this formula that you can change uh, the subdivision and um, the Euler characteristic is unchanged. Okay, so this proof is not examinable um, and I'm just going to sketch it. So let's consider two transitions between subdivisions. Um, firstly, if we have one edge, uh, solidity decomposition or subdivision, we can divide an edge into two. So given some edge, we can insert a vertex in the middle of it, which turns it into two edges. Uh, the effect of this on the numbers of vertices, edges and faces is v goes to v plus 1 because you've added that vertex, e goes to e plus 1 because one edge has turned into two edges and you haven't changed the number of faces. Um, so v minus e plus f equals v plus 1 minus e plus 1 minus f because the ones cancels and therefore this expression chi of, f, chi of x is unchanged under this process. Secondly, we can imagine dividing a face into two. So think about your face as a um, polygon with well, um, at least two edges. Um, and we draw an extra edge uh, across the polygon between two distinct vertices and um, this then divides that face into two faces. So under this change, uh, the number of vertices does not change. The number of edges goes to edges plus one because we've added that edge. Number of faces goes to faces plus one because that face has become two faces. And again, V minus E plus F uh, does not change because these ones cancel. Um, so chi of X is unchanged. Um, and in fact, uh, this notion of Euler characteristic works in n dimensions. Uh, if you had a, uh, an n-dimensional topological space with a division into um, cells uh, of dimensions 0 up to n, then the appropriate formula is you take the number, the alternating sum of the number of 0 cells, minus the number of 1 cells, plus the number of 2 cells, minus the number of 3 cells, and so on, up to your top dimension. And um, Euler characteristics in n dimensions have essentially the same properties. Okay, so we claim that any two subdivisions of X uh, can be linked by a finite sequence of moves A and B and their inverses, uh, plus continuous deformations of the subdivision. Um, and because of this, uh, you, if you take two subdivisions, you can link them by a finite number of moves. Each move does not change chi of x, so therefore chi of x is independent. Um, so if you imagine 
taking your surface X, you have two subdivisions into um, cells, maybe triangles. Um, if you want to make to, to kind of transfer between those two subdivisions, you can basically um, make the subdivisions finer and finer. So you're you're dividing X into smaller and smaller um, little chunks, and you should be able to find a, essentially a kind of common refinement of your two subdivisions, uh, which you know you can add more and more edges and faces uh, and vertices till they become the same, and then you can take them away until you've mapped from one subdivision to the next. Okay, um, now as an alternative way of understanding what the uh, Euler characteristic is telling you, um, there is an, a notion of homology group of topological space. So um, let's say we do this over um, a field such as the reals. Um, Given any topological space, we can define vector spaces called the homology groups H i of x, where i is 0, 1, 2, and so on, a natural number. Um, and these depend only on x as a topological space. <coughs> um, okay, so uh, in this case, if x is a compact surface, it turns out that the, H, the homology groups H i of x are non-zero only if i is 0, 1, and 2. Two, uh, because x has dimension 2 um, and the i is bounded by the dimension of x. Um, and then it turns out that the Euler characteristic chi of x is dimension of h0 of x minus dimension of h1 of x plus dimension of h2 of x. Um, so again we have this alternating sum that's kind of like v, that's like e, that's like f. Um, but now the nice fact about these homology groups is that they they don't care about auxiliary choices uh, such as that of a, <coughs> a cellular decompositional subdivision. Um, these really do depend only on x as a topological space. Um, so homology groups are uh, studied in the fourth year course C 3.1 algebraic topology. Okay, um, and homology groups work for essentially well. Homology groups work for any topological space. The Euler characteristic is defined whenever the um, homology groups of your space are uh, essentially finite-dimensional and become zero eventually, uh, so that the uh, this alternating sum of dimensions makes sense. Um, so, well, once you know about homology groups. Um, then uh, you could, of course, take any function of these dimensions. Um, the Euler char characteristic has the um, extra nice property that it is additive under cutting things into pieces. So uh, if, you, um, if you have a topological space X and let's say a closed subspace Y um, and both of them have finite dimension homology, then the Euler characteristic of x is equal to the Euler characteristic of y plus the Euler characteristic of x take away y. So uh, because Euler characteristics have this additive property, um, it, that kind of makes them very easy to compute in practice. And one often uses uh, topological invariance, that is a, um, of such as the Euler characteristic, for distinguishing different spaces. So if you have two surfaces, x and y, and you can compute their Euler characteristics, if the Euler characteristics are different, then you know that x cannot be um, homeomorphic to y. <coughs> okay, so let's look at some examples, um, each of which is uh, constructed by a planar model. We're going to take uh, a rectangle in the plane and identify sides in a different way. Um, so as we've said before, um, if you take a planar model and you identify the sides, then uh, it's not entirely obvious which vertices get um, identified in which groups. Uh, you have to do a sum by um, thinking about which corner gets glued to which, probably. Um, so and we're going to need to know which vertices are identified in order to compute the number of vertices in the result. 
and therefore to be able to compute the Euler characteristic. So let's start with x as a two-sphere, S2, um, built by taking a rectangle and identifying uh, the top side with the right side in this way and the bottom side with the left side in that way. Um, now if you work out what uh, it turns out that the the, uh, the top left and the bottom right vertices get identified, but the other two don't, and so I've written three different vertices. Here is a picture um, of what this looks like as a glued-up topological space. We've got this two-sphere, and it's really the edges are drawn like this, uh, with one, two, three vertices, two edges, and if you cut the two-sphere along here, you can unfold it uh, into a disk, which is a one-face. Okay, so in this case, we have three vertices, two edges, and one face. So the Euler characteristic of S2 is 3 minus 2 plus 1, which is 2. And you know you might like to, to play by just drawing for yourself uh, different ways of dividing the two sphere into um, <coughs> uh, in, in, into standard decomposition, subdivisions, and so on. Um, and when you work out the number v minus e plus f, you always get the answer to. Um, incidentally, there is a degenerate example of a, a cellular decomposition, um, which has one vertex, one face, and no edges. Um, so you can get this by taking the, the two disk and mapping um, the boundary of the two disks to a single point, and um, then the rest of the two disks, the interior, is mapped to S2 take away zero. Um, uh, so <coughs> um, that actually satisfies the condition for being a, a cellular decomposition. I'm not quite sure if it satisfies the condition of being a subdivision, but um, we tend not to think about uh, that too much because we prefer to have edges in, in our head, in the example we, we do. Okay, so um, let's look at the two torus next. So this is done by taking a rectangle and identifying the bottom side with the top side like that, the left side with the right side like that. In this case, uh, all four vertices get identified with a single point in X. Here's a picture. Uh, it looks like uh, the American kind of donut with a hole in the middle. Um, and imagine taking a single vertex there, drawing one uh, edge around um, the loop which goes through the hole, drawing uh, the, uh, um, the other edge around the loop which goes around the hole. And if you cut along that edge and this edge, then what's left unfolds into a rectangle a single face. Okay, so the torus then has a decomposition uh, into bits with one vertex, two edges, and one face. So therefore the Euler characteristic chi of t2 uh, is equal to zero. Um, <coughs> okay, um, next example is of rp2. Uh, we get this by taking our um, a rectangle and identifying opposite sides in opposite directions. Um, in this case it turns out that um, opposite vertices get identified. So now we have two vertices, uh, two edges and one face, um, and therefore the Euler characteristic is 2 minus 2 plus 1, which is 1. Um, note that that's odd. Um, so this, this surface has a property of not being orientable. Um, we'll explain orientability uh, in one of the next lectures. Um, orientable surfaces cannot be embedded into three-dimensional space. Sorry, non-orientable surfaces can't, uh, which makes them difficult, more difficult to visualize. Um, one way of thinking about what a... So RP2 is really S2 divided by plus or minus one. So you can think about it as a hemisphere, let's say the lower hemisphere of the sphere, uh, with the opposite points on the equator identified. Um, finally, uh, the, the Klein bottle, um, X, 
is defined by um, taking a, a rectangle and identifying opposite sides. So one pair of sides we identify in opposite directions, uh, the second pair of sides we identify in the same direction. So um, in this case it turns out again that all four vertices get identified. So we have um, one vertex, two edges and one face. So the Euler characteristic of the Klein bottle is 1 minus 2 plus 1, uh, which is 0. <clears throat> so here we have the torus and the Klein bottle both have Euler characteristic 0. Um, and um, so, but the, the, the torus and the Klein bottle are not isomorphic. So therefore the Euler characteristic does not actually distinguish compact surfaces. You can have two different compact surfaces with the same Euler characteristic. In fact, we'll see that if you know uh, the Euler characteristic and the orientability of your surface, then those two things together are enough to distinguish all surfaces. So in this case, the, uh, the torus is orientable, the Klein bottle is not orientable. So here's a picture I've attempted to draw of the Klein bottle. So because it's not orientable, you can't embed it into three-dimensional space. However, you can immerse it into three-dimensional space, where an immersion is a, a map from your um, surface into three-dimensional space, which is kind of locally injective, but the thing is allowed to cross itself. So here um, I've drawn something that a, a demented glass blower might have produced. Um, so along this orange circle, the um, the surface is actually passing through itself. So imagine this as being a bit like a wine bottle, where the neck of the wine bottle bends around, passes through the um, side of the um, uh, of the bottle, and then opens out to get kind of plugged into the uh, the bottom of the bottle like that. Um, so one interesting thing about this is that it doesn't have an inside or an outside. If you imagine kind of pouring wine into this bit. Um, then the wine can go out through here uh, and then flow out of the bottom of the bottle. 